Oh, how wonderful it is to be in the Lord's presence. Amen. It's wonderful. I don't mean being in church. I mean being in His presence. It's just so wonderful. I want you to turn your Bibles to Colossians chapter 1. Last week, the Lord had put in my heart a word from God to the church. And I believe more than just to us, but it was called, titled, Selling God Out of His House. It's the tinkering of men with the house of God. And the house of God is obviously the body of Christ, and it's the tinkering of Jesus. We tinker with Him, we change Him. Now, I thank God for what he said, but he won't let me leave this, at least not this morning. There's something else that God has me to give. And what that is, is to reject the house that man has tinkered with. You you have to reject it. God will accept nothing of man's flesh, man's work at all. He, He rejects it. You see, when we come to Jesus, we don't come... To be improved. We don't come to be simply changed. We, we come in order that we might be new creations. Something brand new. He doesn't just clean your heart. He says He puts a new heart in you. He puts a new spirit in you. And so God is not interested in salvaging our flesh. He's interested in that being crucified. And a new life. The life of Christ coming forth. Well, I believe when we tinker with God's house, the only thing we can do is just to reject it, to reject what's been tinkered with and desire the glory of God and the fullness of God to come back among his people. Now, I think this is an incredibly exciting day. Um, I think that there are innumerable signs and and. Witnesses out there that that speak of how powerful Jesus is and how feared Jesus is. You know, a lot of what we see in our country, in the world, in society, um, it seems to dishearten or dispirit the body of Christ. It causes us to be concerned, you know, how are we going to reach them? How are we going to reach this world that so despises us and Look how the nation treats Christianity. And, you know, we get our feathers ruffled because they don't want prayer in school. And they don't want prayer in the government. And they don't want God to be associated with public life. At least the Christian God. They don't want Him associated with public life. And it's something that's a private affair. And you must keep it a private affair and a private matter. And, and you know, sometimes we hear all that and we become disheartened. We're disheartened with what's going on in our world. And... If we could see it differently, it's an exciting time. Because all of this is a testimony of how absolutely powerful and feared Jesus Christ is. Can I give you just a case in point um, for no other reason than just to describe this? Every one of you in here, I'm sure, knows of Tiger Woods. It's very sad what has happened to his life. Um, He needs Jesus. He needs to be saved. I, I trust and pray that you're praying for him to be saved and come to Christ. It's very sad what has happened. It's, it's obviously immoral. It's obviously uh, damaging to his family and so forth. And I'm, I'm not here to open all of that up. I think you understand it. But um, what I want to focus upon for just a second to try to demonstrate this is what Britt Hume said. May, all of you may not know that. Probably most of you do. But Britt Hume is a newsman and he's very respected Um, predominantly on Fox News. And he basically made a comment and said that Tiger Woods needs to be a Christian. He needs to come to Jesus because he is not going to find redemption or forgiveness in any other religion. And specifically, Tiger dabbles with Buddhism and so forth. And... um, Well, he was blasted for that. I I mean, he was called upon, he was written about, and uh, he was on another show, um, and they were asking him about that. 
and asking if he was really serious. Did you really mean that? And he said, I meant it. And I say it again. Because there's no forgiveness or redemption anywhere else. Well, what, when I came away and I heard all of this and I heard the attacks upon him, I thought, I really did, I thought, my Lord, this nation is so afraid of you. I mean, if you were as weak and powerless as they want to make us believe that you are, they wouldn't care. They wouldn't care. I mean, you, you could say that Tiger needs to become a Muslim, you know, and needs to become a follower of Allah. And you know, nobody would really get their feathers ruffled about that because Allah's weak. He's a, he's a dead God, a, a demon God. But Jesus is God. He is the living God. His name is all powerful. You, you just want to see how powerful the name of Jesus is? Just go to work Monday and just say his name. Just not, not in a cursing way. Praise you, Jesus, and you will see how powerful that is. You'll bring every demon out, won't you? I mean, every one will come out, you know. And all of the supposed Christians are under their desk. I don't know them. I don't know them. You know, that's how powerful his name is. It's amazing how, how, how powerful his name is. Well, it's true because the Bible says that God has given him a name that's above every name. And at the name of Jesus, everything will bow and humble itself and confess that he is Lord in heaven, earth and under the earth to the glory of Jesus Christ. The demons are terrified of Jesus Christ. He hasn't lost an ounce of power. He hasn't lost influence. He hasn't lost ability. None of it. But when we tinker with Jesus and we tinker with his house and the glory of God is compromised, God's not going to share his glory with anybody. He's not desperate. Read the churches in Revelation. Read what Jesus says. He's not desperate. These are his churches. And all of them but two are in serious trouble. And what does Jesus say? You better get right or I'm getting rid of you. I'm going to remove your candlestick. I'm going to remove your influence. I'll remove my glory. I'm not desperate. You're desperate for me. I've said this before. I'll I'll say it again in the weeks to come. But uh, the church, apart from the Holy Spirit, is not the church. But the Holy Spirit, apart from the church, is still the Holy Spirit. He is undiminished. He does not need us. We need Him. And the only means of influence and power that the church has is the presence of God. Moses went into Egypt. Now, I didn't get to get into all of this last week. Touched on some of this and closed, but the Lord said, I had to come back and elaborate on this. But Moses went into Egypt. He didn't go into Egypt with a doctrine. He didn't go into Egypt with a theology. He didn't go into Egypt with some good ideas. He went into Egypt, not even with a word from God. He went into Egypt with all of that, but something more. He went in with the presence of God. God had touched Moses' life. He was not the same man. The holiness of God had arrested Moses, confronted Moses, dealt with Moses, humbled Moses. And in that state, Moses was brought by God, with God, into Egypt to demand the liberation of his people. Well, what has to happen? Proof. Proof has to happen. Pharaoh says, who is this God that we should obey him? And Moses knew that they were going to say that. Because that's what anybody would want to say. When I go to Egypt and I tell them that you have sent me to demand the release of Israel, and they ask, who is this God? What am I going to say? And God says, you tell them that I am, that I am, has sent you. And so Moses goes into Egypt and there's a display of power. And so God works a miracle through Moses' life. He throws his staff up on the ground. It turns to a serpent. The magician's... Likewise, in Pharaoh's court, take their staves and they throw them on the ground and they become serpents. The, the miracle is matched. But what you will always find is God goes beyond what the occultism can do. And Moses' snake's ate, snake ate the other two up. And then another miracle happens. And in that miracle, Moses performs. The magicians are crawled into Pharaoh and they said, you see what he's done in the name of his God? Can you do this? Can you do this in the names of our God? 
And the, and the magician says, don't worry, Pharaoh, we can do it. And they did it. And they matched the miracles. And they would match the miracles. And the frogs would come into the land. And, and Pharaoh's men, magicians, would bring frogs. And they, they couldn't remove them, but they brought them in. When they had to get rid of it, they had to ask Moses. And Pharaoh said, please, get these frogs out of here. And they would do it. But there was one instant, this, this is the thing, and, and we've got to understand it, because the thing that sets the church apart... From everything else, it's not our preaching, it's not our singing, it's not our testifying, it's not our vocabulary. It is the presence of God. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. That's communion with God. That is his presence. The presence of God is the essential ingredient that sets Christianity apart from everything else. He is a living God who lives among his people. And without his presence, everything's dead and stale. And we try to bump it up, you know. We try to stir it up. We try to stir the emotions. We try to stir, stir the soul. And then we tell it when we get it to a condition that we, we think it's religious or spiritual, we say, now the presence of God is here. And, and we do, you don't have to tell anybody the presence of God is there. If he's there, you know he's there. If you don't know he's there, you need to be born again. I mean, because he's, he's just there. And he comes, and he comes with power and glory. And so Moses goes into Egypt, and when he's there, he comes to this moment where Moses transforms the dust into lice. And an inanimate object becomes alive. Dust becomes life. And it's lice, and it's all through Egypt. And the magicians went out there to do it. And they worked all of their spells and all of their incantations. And they come back to Pharaoh and they said, we can't do this. Now, they made a statement in the Hebrew. The picture of it is this in regards to Moses, not that he's anything. But they said he is the finger of God. We cannot duplicate this. And guys, they can duplicate our preaching. They can duplicate our singing. They can duplicate our testament. Much of what you see today in the church world can be done by a poor actor. Much of what you see. The speaking, the persuasions, the charisma. Oh, there are people a dime a dozen that can be like that. That's not the answer for the church. Not the answer for our society. It's not going to make the lost found and the blind see and the lame walk. It is the presence of God. And one of the reasons God has withdrawn so much of His glory and power is because of the appetite of ministers. Oh, if a miracle happens, we're ready to jump on that and promote ourselves as miracle workers. We can make money out of this. We can get on TV. We can become popular and powerful and we can now tell people we have the power to heal and give us your money and we'll pray for you. We'll put you on our prayer altar if you send us ten dollars in a letter. And we've made business and merchandise of the house of God. They tinkered with it in the New Testament when Jesus walked in. And the house of prayer was turned into a house of merchandise. And they were selling all of the things for the sacrifices and at abusive rates. And Jesus clears it out. Well, we're not selling the turtle doves and, 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 the, and the lambs and all of that in God's house. But we're selling miracles. And we're selling prayer. And we're selling the anointing of God. And God is insulted by this. Because we have made merchandise of God. And He is nobody's fool. He really isn't. So when this happened with Tiger Woods and the people were so afraid at what Brit Hume said, they, if, if Christianity is as weak and impotent as the society claims that we are, they should have laughed at him. But instead of laughing at him, they were afraid of him. I'm afraid of you. And do you know what? When the public really talks to an authentic Christian, I mean authentic, I mean a person truly born of God, truly believes the word of God, has the Holy Spirit living inside? Do you know that the world, in a conversation with you, will, would love to talk to you? They can't understand you. They can't understand your mentality. You get into the real fundamentals of Christianity and what Jesus is able to do and who He is. And I'll guarantee you, you'll have puzzled looks upon people's faces and they'll ask you questions like this. Do you really believe that? I can't believe you believe that. You really believe that? Absolutely. You know, it's just so rare for the world to run into an authentic Christian who believes that. 
who believes and has the audacity of faith to stand for it and, and proclaim it and demonstrate it. In Colossians chapter 1, we pick up here this morning, and I, we read this a little bit last week, but I just want us to come back to it. It says this in verse 18, speaking of Jesus, he is the head of the body. The body is his, his it's his church, that's us. We are the body. Jesus is the head. It is an illustration that we're given of a human body, how the human body functions. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. In everything Jesus is to have the preeminence. all about him. Everything should be concerned, be brought to Jesus. Is this what you want? Music should be done in such a way that through prayer, it's brought to Jesus, is this what you want? The preaching should be, is this what you want? The teacher should teach in such a way that they've been before God and they're able to say, is this what you want? You have the preeminence. But oftentimes today, we, we may sing, I wonder what the people are going to want to sing today. And we preach and we're influenced by the, by the pressure of people and we think, I wonder what they want to hear today. And the teachers teach, I wonder what's exciting, I wonder what there's some new little thing that I can give, because everybody's so bored with the Bible. No, they're bored with our dullness. They're not bored with the Bible. The Bible's exciting. Who knows the Bible? Who knows it in and out, up and down? Who knows it inside and out? We're all learning Christ, aren't we? We're all, we've made it boring, but God's not boring, and the Word of God is not boring, but it's what we do to it. And so Jesus is to have the preeminence in everything, and he is to have the preeminence in all things. And I want you to understand that the church, for all intents and purposes, is Christ. It, it is Jesus. He is the head. He is, he is the body. We, we make up that body, but it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Ephesians says that the church, by definition, is the habitation of God by the Holy Ghost. That's what the church is by definition. The church is not a church. You know this. It's not a church because we claim to be a church, because we have the name of a church, because we have a tax-exempt status with the government, and they say that we are a church. That's not a church. It might be a church and society among people, but by definition, according to Ephesians, it must be the habitation of God by the Holy Ghost. And when it is that, whether it's two or two thousand, it doesn't matter. It is the church. He is there. His body is functioning. And he is to have the preeminence in everything that's done. It is upon Christ that men meet God and God meets man. We cannot meet with God on any other ground or any other term. That's why Jesus must have the preeminence. If Christ is here and we gather in his name... If he's the preeminent one, everything is done for him, to him, and through him. He is there in our midst. If you gather, if two more gather in my name, I'm there in the midst of them. Apart from the presence of Jesus, there can be no ground of meeting with God other than the ground of judgment. That's the only ground. But in Christ alone, men can meet with God in mercy and in grace and in fellowship. It's the only way. And so oftentimes people pray for God to come. They pray for God to visit the church. They pray for God to come with revival. If he showed up, like so many people claim that they want him to come, we'd have a situation on our hands much like was in the book of Acts with the death of Ananias and Sapphira. The holiness of God's presence, because it's not met on the ground of Christ, and those individual people would be judged by the presence of God. Severe things would begin to happen. So Christ is the means by which we meet with God, have fellowship with Him, and walk with Him. This is all essential. Now, it is the desire of Satan, his purpose, to always dismantle the presence of God. To somehow move or force the glory of God out, so men gather in the name of God, but not in the presence of God. He loves that. Because if I can have a gathering of Christians apart from the presence of God, I can have an impotent church and I can take the society and make them look at the church and say, see, this is Christ. This is the church. This is Christianity. It is weak and it's powerless and it's no different than any of us. And so you find the divorce rate among Christians the, the same as in the world. You find sexual perversion from the pulpit to the pew in the churches today across America. You find immorality. You find disloyalty. You find everything existing in the house of God. And Satan says, see, those are the Christians and they're no different than we are. 
And they, that's what they say. That's what they say about us. Well, only the Holy Spirit can make that, that charge and prove it to be wrong. That my people are different. He's the only one that can do it. And he comes to his house. And you are his house. You as an individual. He comes to live inside of you and to fill you up. Now, I want you to see this. This is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to read just a few passages here. And then we're going to go into the book of Ezekiel for a moment this morning. And I just pray you bear with me with scriptures that we have to read this morning. They're very important that you see them. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I want to begin in verse 7, because I want us to see that the work of Satan is very aggressive, very effectual, because, I mean, and even, he, he was even to get in, able to get into Paul's churches. I mean, the Apostle Paul of all people. He was even to get in there and tinker with the house of God and the people of God and, and cause all types of abuses to come in. So listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 7. He says, Paul's asking the church this. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? Am I your enemy because I freely give you the gospel? And, and for all intents and purposes, that's the way Paul felt. Because of the things that were going on. And he says in verse 12, he says, but what I do that I that I will do that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers, they're his ministers, also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose ends shall be according to their works. And so, what does Paul tell us? He said, listen, this is is a no-brainer. This is what happens. Satan's desire, Satan's purpose, Satan's passion... Is to always get in among the things of God. That's what he's always wanted to do. That's what he always strives to do. The church is not off limits to Satan. The church is his bullseye. That's what he wants. He wants to get as close to it as he possibly can. Satan appears as an angel of light. And Paul says we should not be surprised or count it some really incredible thing. Can you believe they taught that? Can you believe they're preaching that? Oh, I couldn't believe they're bad because they have so much good things to say. Well, Satan had a lot of good things to say in the garden. He said a lot of the word of God, but he said enough damage or enough error in that to bring the woman into deception. He didn't just come with her with a bunch of lies. He just added to the word of God. He took away from the word of God. He moved himself off of what God said and they started talking about what God said. They started feeling about what God said. They started thinking about what God said. And then she started to put in her two cents about it. Satan built upon that. And now she's deceived and she's confused and she does what God has forbidden them to do. And then Adam sins and the whole nation is plunged into sin. And so Satan has always, from the beginning, transformed himself into an angel of light. And he has... He has ministers. He has ministers. His most effective ministers are not ministers of atheism and agnosticism and other false religions. His most effective ministers are those ministers that have gotten away and allowed into the house of God and portrayed themselves as prophets of Christ when they bring in damnable heresy. And for the most part, people sit back and say, but they love Jesus and and they love this. And and look how good all of this is happening. And Paul said, and there's enough, he said to the Corinthians, but what he said to the Colossians was this. You have brought Jesus down to the level of created beings and you're worshiping Jesus and you're all excited about that. And you're all commenting about how much more reverent you are, how much more you love worship, but you're worshiping a false Christ. You have changed the uncreated glory of God, Jesus, into the first thing that God ever made. You've made him on the level of angels. 
And you're, you're allowing men to rob you of your reward. And this was the serious situation that was going on in Colossae. And in the book of Corinthians, Paul says, you don't even want the gospel. You, you count me as a, an enemy because I want to come to you and tell you the truth in Jesus Christ. And I don't want to take any money from you. I just want to give it to you. And he says, it's amazing. I've, I've become your enemy because of that. Well, I'll tell you what, Paul says, that there are false prophets. They appear as angels of light. They appear as ministers of righteousness, but they're not. They bring in damnable heresy and they come as the enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. And we have to be aware of that, what the Paul says. And my only purpose in, read, in reading this passage of Scripture is to let you know that the house of Jesus Christ is not off limits to Satan. He tries very hard to get into it. And I believe through the effort of man, sometimes working in his own deception, sometimes doing exactly what he knows to do, is content to build a false house and call it the house of God. And in this house of God, there is great tragedy. Ezekiel talks to us about it. Before we go to Ezekiel, there's a passage, you can read it. It's in Revelation chapter 3. It's, it's to the church at Laodicea. Now, a lot of people, and I believe this to be true, said that the churches in Asia that Jesus had John write to were literal churches. I believe that. I believe these were literal churches going through literal problems and sin, sins and things that were going on in the church. But I also believe, as much of the Old Testament is written, that it also conveyed a spiritual principle. And I believe it also, as well, these churches serve to provide a spiritual principle and a spiritual truth about how the churches will be throughout the ages from the inception of the church to the coming of Christ. And if this is true, then you will find in Revelation chapter 3 to the church at Laodicea, the church is missing something very, very important. It has money. It has wealth. It has power. It's full. It's got everything that it could possibly, it thinks, need. But it doesn't have Jesus. If you notice where he is in Revelation chapter 3, he is on the outside knocking to get in. If you will open that door, I will come in. And I believe it is a direct portrayal of the events and the things that will be happening just prior to the coming of Christ. For there will be so much going on in the church world. Wealth, money, possessions, being full, satisfied, having everything in the name of God and calling ourselves a church when the whole time Jesus is just, hey guys, let me in, let me in. Just like this prophecy this morning. Watch, pray, be ready. Let me in, let me in. You can't do this without me. You don't know, even though you're wealthy with money and you're full and all, you don't know that you're naked and you're cold and you're destitute. Because if you don't have me, you don't have anything. And so this is it. And I just want you to see that very real thing. In the book of Ezekiel, there is revealed here a house that man builds and a house and the house of God. And they're set in opposition to each other. Now, here's the amazing thing. Please listen to this. I haven't told you where to turn yet because I want you to listen to me. This house that man builds is within the house of God. It's within it. They built walls with untempered mortar. They had things going on because they wanted to look official. They wanted to seem right. They had their prophets. They had their teachers. They had everything that went on it. It looked very religious. It looked very noble. It looked, in many cases and points, very authentic. But God wasn't fooled by it. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, I want you to see, and we'll go to this particular passage now in Ezekiel chapter 13. And we're going to read several scriptures, and I just want you to please stay with me. We're going to begin in verse 8. This is describing the house of man. That he built, he says, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because you have spoken vanity and seen lies. Therefore, behold, I'm against you, saith the Lord God. And my hand shall be upon the prophets that see vanity and that divine lies. They shall not be in the assembly of my people. Neither shall they be written in the writing of the house of Israel. Neither shall they enter into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord God. Because 
even because they have, listen, they have seduced my people. And how did they seduce them? With words. They seduced them with words. And what were their words? Peace. But there was no peace. And one built up a wall. And lo, others daubed it with untempered mortar. Say to them, which daub it with untempered mortar, that it shall fall. It will fall. Now, if you go down to verse 17, it says this. Likewise, thou son of man, set your face against the daughters of your people, which prophesy out of their own heart. It's out of their own heart. They prophesy and prophesy thou against them and say, thus saith the Lord God. Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make kerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will you hunt the souls of my people? And will you save the souls alive that come to you? This is this is the passion of God. Listen, it's always been God's desire. It boils down to the very thing that God loves and wants to redeem, and that's the souls of man. That's what's at stake here when the glory of God is lost. That's what's at stake. The true redemption of men. The true conversion of souls. And, and to sew pillows to the armholes, this is what it meant. This is, you, you can study this on your own, but this is what you're going to find. It was, it was the pillows that would be used for reclining when they would stretch their arms over the tops of the furniture, it was the pillows that were draped along the armholes so that they could recline back with comfort and without care. And then the kerchiefs that they would put on every stature were incantations. It was spells. And if you'll notice, they put it on the heads of these things because Satan is trying to put a spell upon your mind. He's trying to confuse our minds. He's trying to dilute us from the truth and the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. And he's trying to complicate it. And he's trying to distort it in our minds with our thinking and our intelligence. And man, when he begins to put his mind with the word of God and tinkers with it, we are in grave danger. It is what it says. I believe the Bible is the Bible says. I don't know how God did that miracle, but he did it. I don't know how God saves, but he saves. I don't have to understand it to believe it. I believe it because God said it. It has to be that. and We have to preach it as such. I told you this before. I, I fought with, with arthritis in my body for about eight years. I, I was plagued with it, intense pain, discomfort, everything in my body. God taught me so much through that period of time in my life, so much. But the greatest thing I believe God taught me was when Satan attacked me in that. He attacked me and his attack was to seduce my mind. He tried to put a spell, as it were, upon me and my thinking and my thoughts. And he came against me one time when I was in great pain myself, praying in a crusade for others that were sick. And Satan came up to me and he said, how dare you? How dare you pray for somebody to be healed when you yourself are sick? And he, he so disrupted me at that moment. He so in an attempt to overthrow my faith. He did so much damage to me in that moment. I could discern immediately the weakness of faith that came upon me to pray for the sick. The confusion that I had. The questionings that I had. The wrestlings that I had with God. And then I came and I started to home and through these years with all of this stuff that I was dealing with. And I would just remember reading things. And, and Satan would come and he said, if God was a healer, then he would heal you. You're not healed because he's not a healer. And these were things that he would put in my mind. And the Holy Ghost, thank God, the Holy Ghost rescued me one day. He just rescued, he just sovereignly came and rescued me. And this is what he told me. He said, don't ever build the reality of who I am from your circumstances and experiences of life. I am not what I am because you in your experiences can testify to it. I am what I am because I said it in my word. This is who I am. And you preach that I'm a healer whether I ever heal you or not because I said I'm a healer. And you pray for the sick if you're in the greatest pain of your life because I told you to pray for the sick. I told you to do this based upon what I said. 
But these, these seductions of the mind, the seducing of spirits, everything. And then they want to come give us some garbage. The reason you're still not healed is because you need this or you need that or you haven't shown enough. I'll tell you this. I'm healed the same way I am forgiven. It wasn't paid for with man's money. He nailed my sins to the cross and He nailed my sickness to the cross. I am forgiven and healed because He paid it. I don't have to send some false prophet money to try to get him to pray for me. I've got an intercessor at the right hand of God praying for me. That's all I need. I have the faith to pray to God myself. Jesus said, if I ask the Father in His name anything, He will do it. He will. There may be men who don't pray for me. There may be men who don't pray for you. But if you'll go to the Father in the name of the Son, whatever you believe, you shall have. That's all you need. That's all you need. That's what He wants us to have. But we distort this house. We put all the gimmicks in it because man came to realize, and I believe this is the greatest seduction of Satan upon the ministers, they come to realize this is a place where a lot of money can be made. A lot of money can be made. Now, that's not popular among preachers. Probably probably popular with you. But for a preacher to say that, that's not real popular, but it is the truth. The distortion of God's house has come because man realized he could manipulate the people and he stopped serving them for God and he started serving them for himself. And instead of him being the lowly one by which he would uphold the body which was Christ's, and I mean just being a faithful servant to it, He took everybody and stood upon them to make himself something, to make his name something. You look at these modern ministries today. I mean, did you ever see the school of Paul? Did you ever see the seminary of Peter? We put our names on that to make ourselves something in the earth among men So that men will remember who we are and admire the fact that we are men of God. And for the most part, these are powerless, puny people who don't know the presence of God because they sold God out for the gold. I say that with all of the fear. I've wept through this all week long. But it's the truth. And you look out there and you see precious souls that Jesus died for. And he said, when you go out there and you promise them comfort, because this is what the false prophets today are promising us. We're promising you comfort. We're going to tell you how you can make money. We're going to tell you how you can sow and reap. And you give 10%. God's going to give you 100 back. And we're believing for these things. And you give to this. And it's it's all about comfort. You listen to the average radio message today. You pick up the average book in any Christian bookstore. Listen to the average message on any type of TV evangelist. And I'm not against them all. I'm not. Please don't think that. But I'm telling you the average of it all. It's telling you how to make it in this world. I don't want to make it in this world. I want to get out of this world. I mean, I want to make it, you understand, but but not because you teach me how to be a success among men. Not because you, you get me into some gimmick. No wonder we've got people that have been seduced into these types of movements over the last 60 years. They've been seduced into these movements. It all started back with Norman Peel about the positive confession thing. And, and surely it all started back in that. And people started confessing these things, positive confessions, wanting to do it, wanting to make it. And you know what? They positive confessed until they could confess no more and nothing was changed. They weren't one whit more saved. They weren't closer to God. They weren't delivered. They weren't healed. And they decided Christ in the church is a bag of lies. And they've left the church in droves. They've left it. Some of the most popular comedians, some of the most popular political speakers today that are so much against Christ were people who were at one time involved in the church. Their father's ministers. I I don't know the guy's name. He was a very crude, short, chubby, long-haired comedian of years ago. So crude. 
And almost everything he talked about was Christ. And he just put God down. He put the church down. Died a tragic death. His father was a Pentecostal preacher. What happens to these people? I believe this. You sold me a bag of lies. You told me things that didn't even help you. And it doesn't help me. Nothing's true. Nothing's true. When everything in Christ is true. Everything. And they blame it on God. Because it was called the house of God. And it was called the word of God. And it was called the prophets of God. And they blame it upon God. It wasn't God at all. God had nothing to do with it. It was the lies of people who spoke out of their own hearts. And they told the people lies. They told the people what they wanted to hear. And they said everything's going to be okay. But it's not going to be okay. And they told the people peace. But there was no peace. And people today, Jesus is coming. He's coming back very soon. I don't know what's going to happen in our world, in our economy, in our government. It's a very dismal thing when you look at it, at the direction that our nation is coming. Jesus is coming, but I'm not going to tell you everything's going to be okay. I don't know how long it's going to be before he gets here. I don't know what we're going to have to live through. I don't know the type of persecution that we as Christians may have to face. But I know this, that that word to seek and to pray and to be with God so that there will be his power upon our life to sustain us and carry us through whatever may come. The house of man is a very dangerous house. If you would continue reading, he says this in verse 19. And will you pollute? I just want to read it again. Will you pollute me among my people? Will you pollute me? Among my people. That's where Satan always wants to get. I want to pollute you among your people. Will you do this to me for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread? You're going to sell me out for a handful of barley? You're going to sell me out for a piece of bread? That's how cheap I have become? To slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live. By your lying to my people that hear your lies. And I, th- I thought about that. You, you kill the ones that should live and you give life to the ones that should die. I've seen it happen now. I've, I've, I guess I've been alive long enough to see it happen. I've seen it happen. I, you know, I touched on this last week. And, I, and, and, and the pressure, and you see if this isn't true, but the pressure, especially if you're a minister, you're a teacher, you see if this isn't true, the pressure is to direct your message to the most anemic believer in the room. The most carnal. The spiritual, the hungry, the thirsty after God, the ones that really want to go deep with Christ and be taught the Word, are the ones that are oftentimes most neglected in order that everything might be catered to those that are the most anemic, the most carnal, the most fleshly, because those are the ones most likely to get their feelings hurt and get upset and leave. And everything, we think the spiritual are just always going to be there because they're spiritual and they're mature and they're consistent. And we starve them to death. And we feed and we lie to the other ones that are coming, telling them that everything is fine and everything is all right. When maybe it's not fine, maybe it's not all right. And, and I see it this way. They need to die to themselves. They need to give their lives to Christ. And we're telling them you don't need to die. God, God loves you and God's mercy. Yes, he loves you. Yes, he's mercy. But have we not read the word of God that if we don't come to Christ, we will go to hell? I know that's not popular today, but isn't that what the word says? It's, this, it's, it's what happens today. I was speaking to a, a minister who is the pastor of a seeker-friendly church. He just simply says, I lead a seeker-friendly church. It's what we are. He's very proud of it, very happy with it. And I said, and you have other religions coming to your church. I know that you have Muslims going to your church. Now, if they die in Islam, they're going to hell. And I know that some of these people have been coming to your church for years. I don't, first of all, understand how a Muslim can go to church for years. But when are you going to tell them the truth? In his words to me, if I told them the truth... They'd leave. So you don't tell them the truth, so they'll stay. 
When do you ever get around to telling them the truth? Well, we believe they hear bits and pieces of it and they'll put it together one day. But we don't want to offend them. We don't want to offend anybody. We want it to be easy and comfortable for everyone that comes. And that's the danger of this house. i got to move on. He says this in um, verse 20. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I'm against your pillows, wherewith you hunt the souls to make them fly. And I will tear them from your arms and will let the souls go, even the souls that hunt to make them fly. Your comfortable life. I'm, I'm going to free people from that seduction of just wanting to be comfortable, wanting it to be easy, wanting it to be relaxed. I just, I just want to feel good. I'm going to cut that out and I'm going to set these souls free. Your kerchiefs, your seductions also will I tear and deliver my people out of your hand. And they shall be no more in your hand to be hunted. And you shall know that I am the Lord. Because with lies you have made the heart of the righteous sad. You've made the heart. How many people today are sad? They're not getting the word that they want to get. They're righteous. They're hungering for God. And it seems like they've been overlooked. You've made them sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. You've promised him life, but he's not saved, he's not redeemed, he's not born again. But you've told him it's all right. God says in chapter 14, you can read this in verse 21, there are four things I'm going to send upon this house. And I'll just say it this, he's going to send the sword, famine, beast, and pestilence. You think about it for just a second. The sword is this, I'm going to bring my word. But people don't understand that my word is a sword. That's what he said of it. The word of God is a sword, sword sharper than any two-edged sword. Separate soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerns the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Well, who likes that? But that's what it is. And you know what? I'm going to bring my sword because I love souls and I love people. I'm going to bring this the spiritual application of this. I'm going to bring my sword. But the sword's going to cut and the sword's going to be hard. And I know what's going to happen with the people. They're not going to want the sword. And as a result of that, there'll be famine, the famine of my word. People do not want my word. They won't get my word. And instead of my word, what they'll do is they'll heap up teachers who will tickle their itching ears and tell them anything that they want to hear. And there'll be a famine of my word in the land. And when the famine of my word comes, there will be the beast that come in. When you have the famine of God's word, you're opened up to every heresy, every damnable thing that can come. The wild beasts begin to come into the house of God. They begin to come in among the people of God and they begin to devour them. Our children are devoured by our society today. We've, we've heard this, we've seen some of the statistics that it's something like over 70% of young people who grew up in the church when they get out of the church, leave the church and never come back. The wild beasts have devoured them. I thank God that's not the case here. But if we ever lose the word of God, the sword of the spirit, we open ourselves up to famine and beast. It's the only thing that can happen. Apart from the presence of God, that's the only thing we have left to turn to is that. And then the pestilence. You're too dry. You don't feel like you can pray anymore. You don't feel like you have power in your prayers anymore. You feel destitute. You never quite feel right with God. You always feel like there's some distance there. You've lost that intimacy, though you still know him and though you still want him. There's that pestilence, that sickness, that disease that begins to overrun your spiritual life. And God says, this is what I will bring upon that house because it's going to promise many things, but it'll never deliver. It'll never set free. And I want to go to this because this is what God's house is. And this is what you'll find in God's house. Very beautiful thing. In Ezekiel 34, he tells us this. And and, and please read this with me. In Ezekiel 34, listen to God. I pray this is somebody you would want to be. In the first part of chapter 34, he talks about the, the sheep, the shepherds. They have not watched over my flock. They have not cared for them. The diseased, well, look at verse 4. The diseased have you not strengthened? Neither have you healed that which was sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken. Neither have you brought again that which was driven away. Neither have you sought that which was lost. But with force and with cruelty you have ruled them. 
with force and cruelty. You haven't done any of these things. What does it say Jesus would do in Luke chapter 4 when he comes? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. Jesus did these things. Thank God Jesus did it. Jesus didn't come to be bought. He didn't come to be any man's slave. He came to be the servant of the living God. And when he came into this earth, that's exactly what he did. He bound up that which was broken. He brought that which was driven away back. He sought that which was lost and he found it. And not with force, but with love, he laid his life down to redeem us all. What a shepherd. What a shepherd. God said he would send that shepherd in verse five. They were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became meat to all Um, the beast of the field. When they were scattered, my sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yes, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became meat to every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherd search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Listen, verse 11, how wonderful. For thus saith the Lord God, behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. I will, that's what Jesus said when he came to the earth. That's what he said. He said if a woman had a hundred or a man had a hundred sheep, he lost one. He'd leave the ninety nine. He'd go after it and he'd find that one. And all of heaven would be excited about that one sheep that was found, that was brought back, that was redeemed. Jesus says, and we're told here in, in verse 15, I will feed my flock. I will cause them to, to be to lie down saith the Lord God, I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away and will bind up that which was broken and will strengthen that which was sick. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. This is what's in God's house. When God is there and is right and the glory of God is there, this is what's in God's house. And we choose, are we going to have the house of man and tinker with it? Feel good? Every, are we going to have the house of God? Where God in His glory and Jesus is preeminent. It's all about Him. Verse 23, listen to this. And I will set up one shepherd over them. And he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them and he shall be their shepherd. And I'm telling you, that shepherd is Jesus Christ. That is the shepherd. You know, I look out over here. I don't see my people. I see Jesus' people. And I answer to him, I'm an under shepherd. I'm not the shepherd. I'm an under shepherd. Gave me a responsibility. He is your shepherd. He will feed you. He will watch over you. I hate that. I just, I just don't get fed. Well, you need to get with Jesus and he'll feed you. You know, I mean, it's just so pathetic. And I, the Lord will be their God and my servant, David, a prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken it. And I will make with them a covenant of peace and will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land. And they which dwell safely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. And I will make them and the places round about my hill a blessing. And I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. Blessings. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit, and the earth shall yield her increase, and they shall be safe in their land, and shall know that I am the Lord. When I have broken the bands of their yoke, and delivered them out of their hand to those that serve themselves of them, and they shall no more be a prey for the heathen, neither shall the beast of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid." And I will raise up for them a plan of renown, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. They shall no, then they shall know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. And you, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. In chapter 47, the last scripture. Chapter 47, he says this about his house. Afterward, he brought me again unto the door of the house. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house. Waters come out of it, out of his house. That water is the Holy Ghost. In verse 9, and it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth whithersoever the rivers shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish. Because these waters shall come thither, 
and for they shall be healed and everything shall live with the river comes. That's what goes on in his house. That's what happens. And when it's not his house and it's tinkered with and it becomes something else. And when professionalism begins to manipulate the people and it becomes something for money, it becomes something for pleasure. When you begin to demand it to change because you want to have a certain feeling, you want to have a certain attitude about yourself. You want this. Jesus is no longer preeminent. We are. Your desires are preeminent. My desires would be preeminent. And we have to put all of that aside and we have to lay ourselves down before Jesus. And we have to mean it that you are preeminent, God. You come to your house house, fill your house with glory, because look what happens. The waters will issue forth. Life will come. Everything that the waters touch will be healed. That's what God does in his house. His house is a house of blessing. His house is a house of joy. The house of man is a bunch of programs. If you're angry, we're going to teach you how to control it. If you have homosexual tendencies, we're going to teach you how to curtail them. But if you're in my house, I'll give you a new heart and a new life and you will be free. Oh, my God, settle for nothing less than the house of God. I just want to read this to you as I close. It says, Tozer says of God, his greatness cannot be conceived. He is perfectly holy. He cannot be elevated. There is nothing above him, nothing beyond him. God is over all things, under all things, outside all. He's within, but He's not enclosed. He's without, but He's not excluded. He's above, but He's not raised up by it. He's below, but it doesn't depress Him. He's holy above, presiding. Holy beneath, sustaining it all. Holy within, to fill it. He knows every mind, all creatures, all laws, all causes, all thoughts, all mysteries, all enigmas, all feeling, all desires. Every unuttered secret, He knows it all together. He knows all thrones and dominions, all things visible and invisible in heaven, earth, and hell. He knows all motion, all space, all time, all life, all death, all good, all evil. He knows it all. He is a sovereign God. This is the God that wants to fill His house. Listen to what He says of Himself. He is the Most High God. He is the Almighty God. He is El Bethel. I am the God of this house. That's who He is. He'll be nothing less than that. He won't be an ornament in His house. If He's not everything, He'll be nothing at all to it. But when we desire Him to be everything, then He'll be the God who sees. He'll be the God who gives life. He'll be the mighty great God for His people. He will be the God who creates and redeems man from their sin. He'll be the Lord. He'll be the healer. He'll be the provider. He'll be your banner in war. He'll be the God who is jealous over you, not allowing anything to snatch you out of His hand. He'll be the God who sanctifies you. The God who gives you peace. The God who will judge your enemies. The Lord of hosts. The Most High. Your shepherd. Your maker. He will be your righteousness. He will be with you everywhere you go at all times, under all circumstances. He will be the anointed Savior of your life when he's in the house. That's what he, I want to come into my house and I want to bring everything that I've got. What do you have, God? I've got all power. I've got all healing. I've got all wisdom. I've got all joy. I've got all life. I've got everything that you could ever need and more. I've got everything that you could ever want and more. I've got the cattle on a thousand hills. What do I care about governments being in depressions? What do I care? I'll feed you with man. I'll give you water from a rock. I'll put your armies to flight when you lie down at night. No harm will come to you. I just want to be God in my house. That's all I want. Let me come to my house and I'll be all of that. Of Jesus, it is said he is the architect, the living bread, the unsearchable riches, the sure foundation. He is the anchor of your life, your great physician. He is your teacher, your living way, your friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is the rock of ages. He is the rest of your soul. He is your faithful and true witness. He is your king of kings and your Lord of lords. He is your counselor. He's your advocate. He is your redemption, your light. He is your wisdom. He is the master over all circumstances. He is the Lamb of God and your good shepherd. He is your redeemer, your captain, your refuge, your water of life, and your power of God. Jesus is all of that. And I have summarized, if you'll allow me to close with this, that God brings all of this into his house. 
This God who is all of this is the God who will do you good. I will. Those false prophets will promise you, I will do it. I will do it. I will bless those who run to my wings. God knows how to be good. He knows that we need deeply everything in life. And He lavishes us with it. He lavishes us with it. He has healing for the sick. He satisfies every thirsty soul. He puts contentment into every disillusioned, discouraged person. Look what He did to the woman at the well. In one encounter with Jesus, she became the most satisfied satisfied person in all of Samaria. And are there not testimonies in this room? Of people who live their life partying and running after this and running after that. It wasn't the church that helped you. It wasn't a preacher who saved you. But Jesus stepped into your life and now you're satisfied. For the first time in your life, I'm satisfied. Hadn't He healed our broken hearts? Hasn't He healed our broken bodies? Hasn't Jesus brought us peace? When we cry, isn't He the one who answers? When we're in trouble, isn't it Jesus that comes to our rescue? Isn't it Jesus who's changed our mourning into dancing, given us garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness? Hasn't Jesus done all of that? Why would I want the house of man? When God in His house will do all of this. I'm blessed in God's house. Nothing can separate me from His love. He has given me His Spirit. I'm not afraid or disqualified. His Spirit helps my infirmities. God justifies me. All things work together for my good. I'm not condemned in Christ. Jesus intercedes and prays for me. I'm more than a conqueror. I have eternal life. When I'm weak, He is strong. When I have bad days, He reminds me of my future. When I sin, I have an advocate. When more are against me, He is for me and I'm not alone. What a God. What a Savior. What a friend. What a lover. If anybody can show up here today, let it be Jesus. I care for nothing else. Nothing less, nothing else. And that we would just be a people who would come and gather around the blessed Son of God. Stand with me. Let's worship